It's been a great day here. Um, I got here just after lunch, um, and I had two meals in lunch, the former barn, uh, which is great. But really, a high point was spending time with the uh, three classes that came together, uh, Cat's class and Renee's and Rosario's. Um, so it was just a great pleasure to spend so much time with marvelous students. Um, those of you who are on the faculty here are very lucky to have such great students, and those of you who are students are very lucky to have such uh, terrific and dedicated faculty. So it's been an eye-opener, and this is just all icing on the cake. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. When Rosario and I first started um, emailing back and forth about what you all might be interested in, um, uh, Leon Panetta, the Defense uh, Secretary, Secretary of Defense of the United States, had just uh, announced that he and the Joint Chiefs of Staff were going to lift the ban on um, women in combat roles in the U.S. military. Now, for a lot of us, we've actually been watching this for a long time. I, I watch uh, women in the military, and actually, I, I was wasn't Rosario just an actually interesting in the part about what we remembered about the Mexican Revolution and what is buried and what has to be recovered? That was the answer to your question, right? <laughs> I mean, really, um, because it's true in many, many countries. Um, we're just barely learning about what were the diverse roles of women in the American Revolution. Um, and I don't just mean in the military, but in all kinds of ways. Um, but uh, I've been following women in military because I'm interested in militarism. Now, this is quite a different way of following women in military. Uh, I have a lot of colleagues from a lot of different countries, in the Philippines, in Britain, in a number of Australia, a number of different countries, that follow women in the military really as a way to chart what's happening just inside their country's military. And that's really valuable, and there are a lot of people that work very hard on this, they look at it historically, that's very important, and I'm very lucky that I'm kind of part of that circle. But my interest in women in the military, it comes out of my interest in militarism. Now this puts me in a rather awkward position sometimes, as you can imagine, but it's good awkward, you know? Being awkward means kind of standing on one foot, which means you can't go to sleep. You know, you have to be wide awake, and you you really think, I think, more complex thoughts. And what I mean by that is that I am very interested in, in any country, certainly in the United States, because it's where I'm living my life, but I'm interested in any country's relationship to militaristic values. Uh, most people in the world who are militarized, that is, I say if you're militarized, uh, it means that you have incorporated militaristic values it also means that you probably measure um, success and failure uh, in large terms about, in terms of your government, uh, military's own successes or failures. And it means that whatever military needs are, this is what it means to be militarized, what, whatever your government's military needs are, or your insurgency military needs, get prioritized as if they are the need that really should trump all other kinds of needs. So to be militarized takes time. It takes both cultural as well as legal pressures. Um, it takes learning, a certain kind of learning. Um, not all learning is positive. Um, to learn to adopt those sorts of values. And I think in the world today, uh, probably for generations, most of the people in the world who are militarized are themselves civilians. That is, most of the people who have adopted these ideas about prioritizing military values, about uh, giving the military's needs um, first place, of imagining that service in the military is a form of first class citizenship, that is in quotes. Um, most of the people in the world who have absorbed all of that are themselves civilians. When I became interested in women in the military, I became interested because it was one way to look at how the United States and Britain and Australia and Turkey, all the countries I'm interested in, um, actually had become militarized in their cultures. 
And we, in the United States, um, because in particularly since World War II, um, this is the end of the late 18th century, you all are historically minded because you're here at Marlborough, but you can think historically. Um, but the, um, the trajectory of militarized values in this country has not been steady by any means. Um, you'll recall how difficult it was to pass military conscription for men during the Civil War. There were um, uh, anti-conscription riots during the war. Militarization really seems to have gotten a purchase, a hold on American imagination and American cultural values, particularly after World War II. Certainly not in the years leading up to World War I, um, and uh, certainly not really between the wars. Um, but particularly since 19, say, 44, 43, um, and then you can see spurts of militarization. Now, the reason this matters if you're interested in women in the military is that, well, I'm going to say the sentence and then you can see where it makes sense to you. In so far, in so far as a country is militarized, a culture, society, in so far as a culture is militarized, going up the scale here, women's exclusion from the military becomes their ex exclusion from public valued life. Does that make sense? That is, I'll give you an example. Several years ago, when, the, when Norway um, elected its first woman uh, prime minister, Rose Wilkinson, who then went on to be head of the WHO, the World Health Organization, and a very important person in Norwegian politics. Um, and so this was very soon, only probably within a week after she had become prime minister of Norway, the first prime, woman prime minister of Norway. And she gave a, um, There were a lot of international um, journalists there as well as Norwegian journalists. They were telling both in English and in Norwegian. And so she announced her cabinet. And um, she deliberately, and this is never happened in obviously in the United States, she deliberately um, divided the cabinet, so distributed her cabinet ministers post 50-50 um, between men and women. Okay? Um, the United States. Um, so that was also part of the big news. Well, this is one of the things that means to have a woman prime minister who's got some common consciousness is that she will really be careful about how she is appointing people to her government cabinet. So, but then from the back of the room, a journalist, um, not from Norway, um, said, well, and it was kind of a, well, you listen to the question, you'll hear what spirit it was asked in. And, um, prime Minister Grunt, um, you say that you know you really um, thought carefully about distributing um, cabinet posts between men and women equally, um, but I noticed that you gave the Ministry of Defense to a man. Aren't you just perpetuating the masculinization of the Norwegian military, but also aren't you giving amongst the most important posts to Men. And Rose Wilson said, well, maybe in your country, the defense ministry is one of the most important posts, but here actually the justice ministry is the most important post. And what you could, what it was, was an example of a country that isn't as militarized. Actually, the defense minister of Norway is not totally powerless by any means, but that is not where power lies in Norwegian politics. And it was a good wake-up call to anyone who was reading this uh, press conference internationally to think, well, actually, the defense ministry is amongst that and the Department of Treasury, um, of the Secretary of Treasury, are amongst the two most powerful posts in American contemporary politics. It does matter that no woman has ever been appointed Secretary of the Treasury or Secretary of Defense. Um, but that doesn't mean in every country it's the most important. Um, it's really a, on the scale of militarized. How militarized is Norway compared to the United States? Now, because in the United States, I think, since the end of World War II, 
um, the country really has become more and more militarized in how it gauges value, how it measures its priorities, how it awards um, honors. Um, that in fact, it is true that in the United States, it actually does matter what role women have in the military because the military is assumed by so many civilians to be so central to the whole country sense of stuff. If the military were, well, I don't want to get too far into history, but in fact, if the US military had about the same cultural weight in American life as the post office, we would all be much more aware of what percentage of all postal workers were women. Anyone know? Because it's, we don't know because it's not salient, right? It becomes salient because the US military has become so central to American value and American sense of uh, national uh, identity. For that reason, people follow women's roles in the US military particularly closely. Now, the big change, and this probably, again, is something you already have taken on board, but just to remind ourselves where we are here in this history. The big change in the US military's, now watch the word I'm gonna use, dependence on women. That's not women's power, that's the Pentagon's dependence on women in uniform. Came, Think like a US, think like a nervous US military strategy. Okay? At what point would you begin to think? What date? Like almost a day, a date. At what year? What point would you begin to think, oh my God, we've got to let people over here? When we lose middle class men. When did you lose middle class men? Because when did the US military lose? Vietnam, what happened after Vietnam? What, what, what did Congress do? Ended the draft, 1973. 1973 is the big change moment. Not because of the second wave of the women's movement. Although, we'll come back, although the Pentagon liked to elide the truth. But actually, it's because they lost middle class young men. They lost a lot of youth guys here because conscription was over, which the Americans called the draft. And the, con the Congress, which was full of a lot of people who were not white, but quite racist, um, began to have very nervous discussions in ending the male draft in 1973. Now here's what you could have done if you're a member of Congress. You could have thought, we're gonna lose a great many, maybe even most, so long as the economy is pretty good, middle class men, what we could do is then shrink the US military and make our foreign policy less dependent on wielding military might. I mean, that, isn't that a reasonable thing to do if you're gonna lose a lot of your pool of soldiers? But because by 1973, 72, 73, 74, these are really crucial because by then, this military, this militarized view, at least here by civilian members of Congress, I'm talking about their mindset, the, militar the militarization of the American Congress had gone so deeply, nobody could consider, because we're still in the middle of the Cold War, nobody even considered shrinking the military as a way of adap adapting to the end of the draft. So the presumption was, we're still gonna have a highly militarized um, international foreign policy, but we're gonna lose, because we can't force them to join now, we're gonna lose a lot of young men who have other economic alternatives, which is particularly good for middle class men. Therefore, since we won't change our foreign policy, we'll leave it as militarized as ever, we are gonna to have to find a different 
school. Now, at this point, and we've got some wonderful African American uh, military sociologists who have talked about this in a bunch of ways, and all been around when we have these conversations. And what the African American military sociologists say, having trained in the University of Chicago, is that they know from their interviews that in fact there was no fear in U.S. Congress 1976. There was an enormous fear that in fact, well, who would make up for the end of the male dress? Young African American men, because they would have so few economic opportunities in the United States. That fear helped overcome insofar as the members of Congress began to think, well, I don't like the idea of women in the military, but I'm not as frightened of that. I'm actually frightened of African American men in the military. So let's go to the lesser of my fears. And the Pentagon really began to actively develop campaigns for recruitment of women um, after 1973. And that's when you begin to see the figures rise. During the Vietnam War, has some of you been to the, U to the Vietnam War Memorial in New York? Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful memorial. Really an anti-war war memorial. Um, designed, of course, by a young uh, uh, Asian American um, architect, Maya Lin. Um, but when you go there, you can't tell race, of course, because it's all just men. But you can tell gender if you know American men. Um, and one of the things you'll notice is there are very, very few women on the wall of the dead from the U.S. side of the U.S. Vietnam War. Well, one of the reasons was because during the U.S. War in Vietnam, and it's important to fade out those big phrase so that you don't just call it the Vietnam War, because if you're Vietnamese, you have gone through the war with Japan, the war with France, the war with the United States, and after that, the war with China, and earlier, the war with China. If you're in Vietnam, there are many Vietnam wars. We are so self-centered, we call, we call it the Vietnam War, as if that's the only war that matters to them. Absolutely not, right? So the US war in Vietnam was a time when there was a congressional law, rule, that no more than 2% of the active duty military personnel of the United States could be women. So when you see very few women's names on the war memorial, the Vietnam War Memorial in, on the Mall in Washington, one of the things you're seeing is congressional rules about what percentage of all active duty soldiers could be women. It was just 2%. That 2% rule went, by the way, at the end of conscription. So this, so 1973 becomes really important. Now, what does all this have to do with combat? Combat, I've come to believe, should always be written in quotes. And the reason we put all of you who either teach, but especially those who take gender and women's studies courses, you know that gender and women's studies faculty always go like this. Have you noticed that? It's because everything is open to question. And nothing should be taken as for granted, right? So you teach women's studies and you spend half your life doing it, right? <laughs> um, and, and there's, so add quotes around combat. And this is why, because militaries, and this is now goes way back before 1973, militaries, military strategists, and their civilian superiors, know that most civilians and many people in the military, many men especially in the military, are, have a very reverential view of combat. Now reverence is about culture. Right? And that there is a widespread belief in many countries, including the United States, that combat is the hallowed ground, hallowed ground of the warrior. And therefore, it must be a space, a cultural space, 
that is protected and that it is protected in its exclusion of women. It's kind of like coal mining underground, right? No women allowed because it is held so reverentially. Now, if you are in combat, you don't feel as though you're, you're being hit, right? You really feel as though you're being put in a place of danger and maybe don't even feel as though you're being seriously looked after at all. So now we're talking about the culture of combat, not the actual experience of it. So over the years in numbers of militaries, there have been times when in fact the military strategists and their civilian superiors actually have run out of enough men as soldiers that they trust. In our classroom discussion this afternoon, we talked a little bit about this. About this. Most military commanders and the civilians that they report to don't just look out at their society and see an undifferentiated mass of young men. They look out on their society and they see men of different ethnicities and different races. Some they trust and some they don't, which is true, it was true of the Soviet military, it's definitely still true of the Russian military, it's true of the British military, it's true of the Brazilian military, it's true of virtually all militaries in the world that their senior commanders tend to come from very particular ethnic groups and so do the senior civilian um, officials and that they therefore don't look out and see all young men as available because they don't want to recruit men from those ethnic groups that they don't trust. Therefore, when it comes to combat, there is, is a, there's a kind of a dilemma. In some wars, for some militaries, in fact, combat becomes where you put the cannon fodder. That is, the, the men who are considered expendable, the men who in fact don't matter, the men whose families can't protest because you've put them in harm's way. But the idea, watch how complicated this is, but the idea of combat is still revered. Okay? So in the US military, but also in the British military and other militaries that I've had a chance to look at, in fact, combat is always manipulated. The, I, that's why you put it in quotes. I'll give you an example. During World War II, Winston Churchill was, of course, president of, was uh, prime minister of Britain, and of course, the war went on much longer than anybody thought it was going to go on. So usually, it's when wars go on longer than the civilian and um, com commander uh, class think they're going to go on. So it's usually, that's why you watch, the, you watch the gender politics of a military and the ethnic and racial politics of a military, you watch it over time. You don't say World War II. You say 41, do you mean 41 or do you mean 44? Do you mean 44 or do you mean 45? Because the, the formulas and the anxieties about race, ethnicity, and gender change in the course of the war. Winston Churchill had reached 1944. There was no guarantee that Germany was going to surrender in late 44, and there was certainly no guarantee that Britain's war in the Pacific would be ended, which of course it was in 44. In 19, Winston Churchill, as probably most of you know, was not support. He was very, very traditional in his patriotic beliefs. Except when it came to waging a war. And by 1944, when he, remember Britain's a pretty small country, he had really begun to run out of the young men he trusted, that is to recruit into the military. So patriarchal Winston Churchill authorized women in the British military to work on artillery teams. But to try and save some notion of where women should be and where they shouldn't be, here's the formula that he gave the generals to follow in the artillery teams. Women could help push the
the big artillery shells into the guns, aimed at the Germans, but they couldn't aim the guns, because that's common. What you really get to see is that in the middle of wars, there is constant confusion about the needs of the military to wage whatever war they're waging, and the needs of the military and their civilian superiors to hold up the values that are supposedly what you're fighting for, i.e. to maintain the social order that people think they're protecting. And those two things can be get in very serious conflict. In the United States, the most recent version of that has been the new teams that the commanders in the field in um, Afghanistan began using for the sake of intelligence, not for the sake of increasing women's um, equality in the US military. Most commanders, and they're mostly male, most commanders on the US side in the uh, Afghan war. Um, in fact, couldn't care less about the equal opportunity clause of American law. What they cared about was carrying on an increasingly, um, not just hearts and minds, an anti-counterinsurgency, a counterinsurgency policy. And what they began to realize is that they, would, they were not getting enough intelligence, militarily usable information, because they couldn't talk to women in the villages, because their teams that were combat teams were all male. So they began to create these teams. The Marines were the first, and the Marines had the smallest percentage of women of all the services. The Air Force has the highest, the Marines have the smallest. Only 6% of the Marines are, are, women, are women. But, so this is the Marine Corps that introduced this. They introduced teams of women that would go along with the, the infantry Marines, which are supposed to be, in American mythology, the most heroically masculinized of all parts of the American military, that is the infantry in the Marines. But they, assert, they created teams of women to go with those masculinized combat Marine teams to gather information village by village. Now, if you listen to a lot of American women, particularly officers, that is, women who are trying to make their careers in the military, they will say, Panetta's lifting the ban actually didn't change anything. They'd already been in combat. It was just to acknowledge what the reality had become. And the reality had become this not because the military commanders were leaping ahead in their understanding of gender equality, but because they were waging a war with anything they could. And their main concern was getting um, intelligence. And they used women. They used women to get intelligence from Afghan women. So one has to really think carefully about whether you think this is a big step forward. A lot of the women who did this work are, have been interviewed. A lot of them, these are women in the Marines. A lot of them said two things. Well, first of all, so it's a big deal that now we're called combat, when in fact we've been doing combat for the last two years that we've been deployed to Afghanistan. But the second thing you'll hear a lot of them say, honestly, I mean they really believe it, is that they were really actually trying to be of use to women in the Afghan villages to try and offer some medical aid and so on. It's not at all clear that that's what their male commanders think is their value. Every commander who talks about these uh, teams of Marine women in, that are close with the infantry all talk about their intelligence gathering. We learn from women in the villages things that we otherwise wouldn't know. So, Two things. One, combat has been artificial for generations. Combat is really so highly valued because it is so closely attached in people's minds to a certain kind of heroicized masculinity. 
Otherwise, why is a really good quartermaster who is able to handle the very complicated military supply chain, how come that's not where you can be a hero? It's not where you can be a hero. You can be a hero in America and many other countries' culture only when you're doing the thing that other people recognize as combat. For a lot of women who are trying to make careers in the US military, in fact, what was important about Panetta lifting the ban was it allowed them to be acknowledged as having had combat experience. And in the US military, where it is possible to have combat experience, if you're in the Norwegian military, if you're in the Irish military, if you're in the Dutch military, you don't have combat experience. You do UN peacekeeping. You earn your promotions other ways. But the US military, since World War II and during World War II, is a war raging machine. It may do a lot of other things after hurricanes and so on, but it's a war raging machine. And therefore, you only get promotions in the top ranks of the officer corps. And if you're a careerist, that's where you want to go. Uh, if you can show that you have had combat experience. And it has to be combat experience, you know, ends up with ribbons. It has to be combat experience that is officially acknowledged as combat experience by the Pentagon. So a lot of women have said there is a khaki ceiling in the US military because women are excluded from acknowledged combat, which means they cannot claim combat experience, which means they cannot get promotion to senior ranks. Now the women, I mean, I think that's, you know, these are women who want to make their careers in the military. I work with a lot of these women because I have to listen, I have to, I have to understand what they're concerned about. Um, but in fact, it makes me very nervous, as you can imagine. Um, but the only way that I'm gonna actually be able to understand the things I think I have to understand is I have to take them seriously. They see this as a career move, and they see not the glass ceiling, but a tacky version of the glass ceiling within their job arena. For me, thinking about militarism, it means that if Panetta's lifting the ban, we'll come back later to saying really lifting the ban, but at least announcing it. Leon Panetta, the Secretary of Defense, Lifting the ban, in fact, I think more deeply entrenches the, the high value put on this thing called military combat and puts a higher value on it within the American public because it is now seen as a step forward. But in fact, it really entrenches the idea that combat is where you earn your social value. Here's a last point, and then we'll open the discussion. And that is, so who gets to be thought of as having been in combat? Now, a lot of you heard the news today, the horrific news of the bombings at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. So those people weren't in combat? A woman who has beat, been beaten by her domestic partner, she hasn't been in combat. A woman who is in the Eastern Congo, Congo the province of Kivu, which is the most militarized of all the DRC uh, provinces. A woman who has gone through the back and forth between the various armed forces that have rampaged through Kivu. She hasn't been in combat. That is, we define combat, for the most part, is you have been trained and equipped and ready to expect violence. And you respond to that violence when it comes. It's expected. You've been trained to expect it and you are armed sufficiently to respond to it. It's kind of wimpy, isn't it? Yeah. So 
a little different, isn't it, than being just sexually assaulted completely out of the blue, or to be beaten by a domestic partner, or to be a civilian woman living in a village that becomes a crossroads of warring factions. In fact, it's very interesting to think how combat as narrowly and conventionally and popularly defined, in fact, that's an easy target. I don't mean that it's very easy to escape being that. But you are trained, you expect it, and your arms are ready. That's really different than being sexually assaulted by a work partner completely unexpectedly. So I think our rarefication, and I mean all of us, our rarefication of combat is very, very misleading about the relationship of women to violence, of bravery to women to violence, of socially acknowledged capacity to deal with, survive, get through violence. So the ways in which the media, and many of us as the absorbers of media, have reacted to the Pentagon's, quote, lifting of the ban as if it's a major breakthrough. Really, we need to think carefully what, what we were assuming when we thought that. It is true that it is breaking down a long-standing artificial barrier that has been created by Congress, the civilians in Congress, and the Pentagon. Whether it is really a step toward women's liberation, or rather the absorption of more women into a highly militarized notion of what success is, I think is really something we should think about very, very carefully.